Welcome, Catalyst Church. Thank you so much for choosing to join us this morning. Can we just pray real quick? God, we are so thankful for everything that you do in your lives. You are our God, our only true God, and we just worship you and we declare your name this morning. Amen. Stop us, and if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is with us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is with us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is with us, then who could ever stop us
with us Then what could stand against What could stand against What could stand against What could stand against against? Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God, our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God. Our
lifted me up, lifted me up, lifted me up, lifted me up, you lifted me up, you lifted me up, we sing, God with us, God for us, nothing can come again. Stand between us, God with us, God for us. Nothing can come against, no one can stand between lift your name high because there is no one like you. No matter how hard we try to make our own selves God in our own minds, nothing that we can fabricate stands up to the image of you, God our Father. And we are so thankful for the example that you set for us and the way that you teach us and you grow each and every aspect of our lives. God, we just love and we worship you. Show. 
exactly as you wish. Can we make that our prayer this morning? We just sang a song, we, we declared it. But what would it mean if we actually pursue that? Take a moment where you are. Dear God, we love you. God, we thank you 
for who you are and we thank you for loving us, not only as we are, but loving us enough to not leave us there. God, last week we talked about how if we're serving, we are growing. Dear God, that means that you are not content with us staying where we are. Thank you for building us. Thank you for making us who you want us to be. Thank you for helping us to pursue your dream for our lives with our actions, with our thoughts, with all that you have in store for us, Lord. God, we love you and we thank you for what you are doing and we look forward to what's to come. In your wonderful name, Jesus, amen. Amen. I am so glad you are with us this morning. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, take a moment and say hi to the person next to you. Maybe you haven't done it yet because you're still in your pajamas and you didn't realize they had joined you. Stop for a moment. Say good morning. Remember that you're with somebody. There's somebody there with you. And even if they're not in that room with you, here's what I want you to do. On the screen, there's some information. Text CATALYST to 509-385-0811. We have people standing by. They want to pray with you. They want to talk with you. Jump in the chat. Do what you need to do. Let us know you're there so that we can let you know you're not alone. I'm not just talking to a camera. I'm talking to the person on the other side. We're glad you're with us, and we look forward to it. Also, this morning, if you have found a way to continue to support Catalyst Church, I want you to know we appreciate it. We appreciate your support. Whatever that looks like, whether you're praying for us, whether you're, you're here on Sundays and you are just happen to be home for this week, whether you're jumping in the chat and engaging with us, whatever you do to support, we appreciate it. Thank you for being a part of the mission of Jesus Christ. God, we love you. We thank you for, for the opportunities that you have given us throughout this season. We thank you for all that you are accomplishing that is far beyond our understanding, far beyond what what we've seen coming. We love you and we thank you for it. And we look forward to what's in store. In your wonderful name, Jesus, amen, amen. Well, good morning, Catalyst Church. I'm excited to be with you. Even if you're not right here in front of me where I could shake your hand and say hi, give you a hug, guess what? I love you, I care about you. And so does Catalyst Church. Here in just a moment, Pastor Bill's gonna jump in. We're excited for, this should be week six of our Serve series. It's the final one, are you ready? Well, good morning, Catalyst Church. So glad you could be with us again this week. I wanna echo Pastor Aaron's words. If you're a guest especially, thank you for joining us today. We're honored to have you with us. So we're gonna continue on this morning in our Serve initiative series. Have you ever been in a three-legged race? You know, years ago at a youth event, I, I think it was a youth camp, if I recall, we did a three-legged race, but we did it with a twist. Now, the first rule was that all four legs or all four feet of the participants had to touch the ground. So there was none of that, you know, the big kid just lifting up the, the younger kid and just running while the little kid flails. There was none of that stuff. The second rule, though, was more interesting. We had it so that each person, or rather one of the participants was facing forward, The other participant was facing backward. Then we tied their legs together. So it was a hilariously chaotic event as each team tried to coordinate themselves to work in harmony. And by harmony, I mean try not to fall over one another and then break a foot. You know, anytime we work with others, whether it's a school project, maybe it's a work project, You know, could even be a family business. If you've ever been involved in a family business, you know, yikes, that can be a challenge in itself. You know, maybe you've been part of a community endeavor. Could even be a church event or a church outreach project. It can be both fun and it can be frustrating. It can challenge us and it certainly can stretch us. So I had a conversation recently with a couple. They're part of Catalyst Church here. And no, I am not going to name names. But they shared with me, that they absolutely cannot do projects together. They learned a long time ago, and they learned the hard way, not to tackle home improvement projects or DIY projects, whatever, together. And they've tried many times, and every time they've tried, maybe thinking they'd matured past that silliness, 
It resulted in disaster. It resulted in hurt feelings. I want you to tuck these illustrations of teamwork into the back of your mind for a little bit. Because here we are at the final stop in our Serve Initiative series. And before we continue any further, I'd like to recap a little bit where we've been in the last several weeks. We have been developing a Catalyst Church theology of service. What do I mean by a theology of service? Well, simply put, it's the vision, the values of why we serve, why we don't just selfishly consume as Christ followers, but why we give of ourselves, why we give of our time, our talent, our treasure, what it is we hope to accomplish, what it is that we are all about doing when you and I serve in Jesus' name. We're calling it the Catalyst Church Theology of Service. Six tenets in this uh, theology, and we've just been rolling through them one, one at a time each week. So let's recap really quick where we've been. The first tenet was that ministry means serving, no more, no less. Followed up with serving means putting the needs of others before our own needs. The midpoint we hit was serving is part of our worship response to God. The fourth week, the goal of serving is to help people become like Jesus. And then last week, if we are serving, we are growing. Today we're going to examine more of the, the communal aspect of serving. If you're following along with me, the first point today I'd like us to look at is that serving creates powerful relationships. Serving creates powerful relationships. Maybe you saw this. In 2001, Steven Spielberg and uh, Tom Hanks, they produced an epic World War II drama called Band of Brothers. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It was absolutely incredibly well done. Fairly graphic, as it, I guess, maybe should have been because it was a very honest portrayal of the company of soldiers called Easy Company. And it followed them really from boot camp all the way through the final days of the war in Europe. It was powerful, and it was a moving portrayal. Now, no one wants the conditions that those men faced, but everyone wants the type of relationships they forged, the common cause, the sense of purpose, sometimes just mere survival. Whatever the impetus was, the relational strength was forged between the men, and it lasted a lifetime. I believe there's actually only one of those men is still living today uh, as part of Easy Company. But that's what everyone yearns for. Even... Come on, even you introverts want this. I understand you introverts just want it to be less together than the extroverts. But you too still want these powerfully forged, strong relationships. I believe that God chose to reveal his nature to us using the context of relationships. The relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It permeates the entirety of Scripture. In fact, turn with me, if you would, to Matthew. The end of Matthew, Matthew 28, a very familiar passage. We've been here many, many times. And Jesus came, and this is verse 18, Matthew 28. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He goes on, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. Be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I bring this up, though, to highlight what he says there, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This verse shows a relationship between all three members of the Godhead. You know, there are about 30 verses in Scripture, in all of Scripture, about 30 verses, which, which all contain a reference to the three in some way. But nowhere is the word Trinity ever used. However, the Trinity is clearly implied. It's implied that there is a tripartite nature within the Godhead. And they have a relationship amongst themselves. 
Now, I'm not going to stand up here today and try to explain it. You've probably heard a million different ways that this has been explained over, the, <laughs> over history or tried to be explained. We just don't know. We just don't know. What we do know is it's clear there is a strong, powerful, obviously powerful relationship within the Godhead. You know, one of the most powerful relationships that we do know about in the New Testament is the relationship between the Apostle Paul and Barnabas. It began when Barnabas vouched for Saul's conversion. Remember, Saul of Tarsus, dramatic conversion experience. His name shifts. That's kind of the clue in the New Testament to how he's kind of a new individual. His name shifts from Saul to Paul. You know, 15 years after that first encounter, 15 years later, Barnabas sought out Paul, enlisting him for a, a short-term mission to Antioch. Well, they later embarked on a, on a missionary journey together. In fact, turn with me to the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 13, we have a, a moment of that. Of that. In verse, uh, verse 1 in 13, among the prophets and teachers of the church at Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon, called the black man, Lucius from Cyrene, Manan, the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas, and Saul. One day as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. And that begins Paul's first missionary journey. 28 times in the New Testament, it mentions Paul and Barnabas, or Barnabas and Paul. Their relationship was forged in service alongside one another. Alongside one another in service to the gospel. And I don't think, I, I don't think that powerful relationships like Paul and Barnabas, the one they had was just for them. I believe that God desires you and, and I to, to forge powerfully strong relationships in our lives as well. Also forged in service to him and to his mission. Okay, I know I have, a, I have a little bit of a tendency to sound like a broken record on this. But to me, it is abundantly clear in Scripture how God expects his people to be productive for his kingdom. When you and I, when we serve together, we do more than just be productive. We also forge the types of relationships that matter when life happens. In fact, that's the second point I want to bring out this morning, the communal aspect of serving. Our first, serving creates powerful relationships. The second is that serving creates protective relationships. You know, there's an adage in leadership circles. People tend to support that which they help create. It speaks to a, a, an ownership of a project or the ownership of an enterprise, that, that when an individual is vitally involved in the inception and the, and the creation of something, they defend it, they support it much stronger than if they were merely watching it happen or just enjoying the benefits of it. I think there is another level to this as well, and it's the level of community. Not only do we support whatever it is we are creating, we support and defend, and we develop an affinity for those we create with. You know, in the law of Moses, the, the, the law of Moses in the Old Testament really is the codified rules for the community of Israel. You know, there was only one punishment greater than death. It was banishment. Banishment from the community, ostracism, was considered a far greater, far more severe form of punishment than was a death sentence. To have the benefits of community stripped away, no longer able to rely on the protective, supportive, strengthening, to be rendered utterly alone, that was a fate considered worse than death. In the New Testament, Paul had to deal with he Paul had to deal with some rough stuff in some of the churches that, that he was a part of and churches that he had founded or that he was leading and mentoring and, and such. 
And one of those, and you've probably heard it before, one of those was the church in Corinth. Man, they had stuff going on. And Paul had to, had to jump in and deal with a lot of stuff. Sometimes it was really intense. Now, we're going to go to a passage today. And I want you to understand, my point in going to this passage really isn't about the topic. I want to talk a little bit more about how Paul leads them in an, in an awareness. Because we're talking about the power of protective relationships. So let's not get too sidetracked on the topic right at the moment. So verse 9 of chapter 5 in his first letter to the Corinthians. So 1 Corinthians 5, verse 9. When I wrote to you before, I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin. But I wasn't talking about unbelievers who indulge in sexual sin or are greedy or cheat people or worship idols. You'd have to leave this world to avoid people like that. I meant that you're not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer yet indulges in sexual sin or is greedy or worships idols or is abusive or is a drunkard or cheats people. Don't even eat with such people, he says. Again, I mention this scripture as an example to show that community is a powerfully protective thing. And Paul is admonishing the Corinthian believers to recognize and cut off those individuals who abused the privilege of community. Now, it's a topic for a different day, really, but the illustration stands. The protective aspects of our relationships cannot be ignored, and they ought not be taken for granted by you and I. So, I mean, we think about these protective relationships thing. I, I come to mind, you know, I had four children. I was raised in a family of three boys. I had, you know, my, my cousins were very close to me, four boys in that, you know. So I'm kind of used to having lots of siblings and things around in those dynamics. But, you know, you can look no further than the relationship between siblings. They can fight like cats and dogs amongst each other. But the moment someone from outside threatens one of the siblings, look out. All of a sudden, these kids that seemingly hated each other a moment ago will fight to defend one another without hesitation. Again, I think that illustrates the protective element of relationships. My point is this. If you want these kinds of powerfully protective relationships in your life, you can either hire a bodyguard or Start serving alongside one another. Nothing knits hearts together faster and more thoroughly than serving together. So we have to kind of ask a simple question. In fact, it's so simple that we never really ask it. If Jesus desires his church to grow, why doesn't he just do it? Why doesn't he just do it on his own? Why involve the mess of people? Why call us all, every one of us, call us to be ministers of his gospel? Wouldn't it be easier if he just did it? Well, truthfully, the answer is found in all of the tenets of our Catalyst Church theology of service. When we put them together in one place, we get his heart for our serving. But before we can do that, I guess I, I probably need to unleash our final tenet. The last piece of our Catalyst Church theology of service. And it's really this. How many can we get involved is a better question than how efficiently can we do it. Let me repeat that for you. How many can we get involved is a better question than how efficiently can we do it. As the lead pastor the, the, you know, the cultural architect, if you will, of, of Catalyst Church, I desire a sense of what I'm calling SOS to permeate everything we do at Catalyst Church. SOS, scoot over some. In everything we do, continually, we have to ask if there's room for one more. Can we allow one more in? Can we get one more involved? Can we scoot over some and make a place for one more person in every single thing that we are doing, every event, every task, every project, every gathering, every everything, can we just scoot over some, make space for one more person? 
ask is there someone else who needs to be involved in whatever we're doing? At every level, in every aspect, who can we invite to participate? Who can we train up? Who can we mentor? Who can we create a ministry opportunity around? I envision it that our serving can be much like a clown car, you know, with people packing in and pouring out of it constantly. We each need to make more room for more people. So back to that question. The question about Jesus and his, how he wants or why he wants you and I to serve rather than just doing it all supernaturally on his own. Rather than him just doing it for us, why does he call us into the task of serving? What is his heart for serving? And how does the Catalyst Church theology of service reflect his heart? Well, let's go back to those tenets. First, ministry means serving. No more, no less. You know, one of the things that always strikes me about Jesus' style is just how simple it is. Serving is simple. It doesn't need to be complex. We don't need to overthink it. In fact, when we overthink it, that's typically when we get off into the tulies or off into the weeds, and we're just, we just we don't do anything. Serving is simple. The second piece, serving, means putting the needs of others before our own needs. That means serving is selfless. Now, I want, we were careful to say, and if you need to go back and watch that message, make sure you do. Careful to, to point out, serving the needs of others does not mean denying our needs. It's a prioritization. It's not entirely self-sacrificing. Well, there's going to be times, sure, but not entirely self-sacrificing. It's just a recognition that serving is selfless. Serving is a part of our worship response to God. That's the third tenet, which really just reflects that serving is worshipful. Serving is worshipful. I love the imagery of Jesus at every turn in his public ministry. You can see that he is being obedient to the Father's request, obedient to the Spirit's leadings. That is worship. The fourth Tenets that the goal of serving is to help people become like Jesus. Well, serving is purposeful. It isn't busy work. It isn't just get some stuff done to keep ourselves out of trouble, you know, the idle hands or the devil's toolbox, that kind of a thing. No, that's not what serving is for. Jesus isn't just giving us a bunch of busy work. It serves a very distinct purpose, and that purpose is to help people, ourselves as a servants included, to help us become like Jesus himself. Fifth is that we are serving, we are growing. That is a reflection that serving is discipleship. Mathetes, the Greek word for disciple or Greek word for learner, it's where we get the concept of disciple or discipleship. We are to be constantly growing and maturing. If we're not, we're dying. Serving is discipleship. And lastly, how many can we get involved is a better question. And how efficiently can we get it done? That's a reflection that serving is actually missional. Serving is an attractional, attractive endeavor. As we serve, people want to be a part. That's a natural human tendency. We all want to be a part of something larger than ourselves. Serving is a missional endeavor. So I want to close this morning. In fact, I want to close this whole series really, you know, on a, there, a years ago, years ago, I saw a bumper sticker. Maybe you've even seen it before. You know, bumper stickers really aren't a thing that much anymore. You know, the pithy statements and stuff. We need to bring those back. Probably not. But years ago, I saw a bumper sticker that simply read, Jesus is returning soon. Look busy. Now, I know, I, you know, I get the, you know, the cynicism in it. I, got, I actually kind of like it. I kind of like, now, I hope we're not looking busy, you know, just doing you know, the appearance of effectiveness and fruitfulness and the appearance of sincerity. I just love that concept. Jesus is returning soon. Look busy. He should find us hard at work. I hope that when he returns, he finds you and I so busy at his mission that we can hardly notice his arrival. I say that tongue in cheek. 
But I really do believe we should be so, our lives so filled with serving one another, serving in his name with a joy that is involved in serving. That when he arrives, he doesn't find us sitting around waiting for him. He finds us busy about his mission, busy about the task that he has left for us to expand his kingdom, to proclaim his love, his grace, his mercy. Turn with me if you would. Last scripture I want to kind of close this series on. It's found in Luke. The words of Jesus, appropriately enough. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus says this, verse 35, be dressed for service and keep your lamps burning as though you are waiting for your master to return from the wedding feast. Then you will be ready to open the door and let him in the moment he arrives and knocks. The servants who are ready and waiting for his return will be rewarded. I tell you the truth, he himself will sit them, put on an apron, and serve them as they sit and eat. He may come in the middle of the night, just before dawn, but whenever he comes, he will reward the servants who are ready. Now, I believe the imagery he's using here isn't just he'll reward the, the servants that are sitting around waiting. They're already dressed as servants. They are in the activity of being, of serving. They are doing, well, they're following the model and the example that he gave. Catalyst Church, as we continue forward, we're going to close this series out today, but we're continuing our serve initiative forward. I believe wholeheartedly that what will distinguish the spiritual, the missional communities of today and tomorrow from those that are simply going through the motions, I believe the distinction is right here. Those communities who lay hold of a theology of service, I think they're the ones that are going to make a difference in the world. I don't think the world is going to be impressed with all of the slick programs, all of the appearances of righteousness, of holiness. I think they're going to be impacted more by groups of, of Christ followers who simply decide we will serve in Jesus' name. We will serve one another. We will serve our larger community. We will serve our God. So my challenge to each and every one of us, don't let this end of a series be the end of a focus. Let's carry it forward. Sign up and show up. Whatever it is, serve. Get outside your comfort zone. Be willing to fail forward in this. Take a risk. Let's serve Jesus powerfully. Let's serve Jesus purposefully. I know that we can do it. Father, I thank you so much that you have called us to be servants. And you, Jesus, have exemplified for us. And Holy Spirit, I thank you that you empower us to serve in Jesus' name. So Holy Spirit, I also ask that you show each and every one of us how we are as servants, to encourage us and move us forward, to ready us for the return of our bridegroom. And Father, I pray that all of our serving in the name of your Son, even in the authority of your Son, that all of our serving would in fact prove a delightful, beautiful offering to you effective and fruitful, productive as it leads more and more people into relationship with you. We give you the honor, we give you the glory by serving. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Catalyst Church, so glad that you could be with us again today. We're gonna kick off a new series this next week. I hope, look forward to seeing you there. Have a great day great blessed week. Amen.